Astounding Stories 20, August 1931, If the Sun Died, by R. F. Starzl, Part 1. By our system of time, we would have called it around 65,000 A.D. But in this cavern world, miles below the long-forgotten surface of the earth, it was 49,889 since the death of the sun. That legendary sun was but a dim racial memory. But the 24-hour day, based on its illusory travel across the sky, was still maintained by uranium clocks, by which the myriads who dwelt in the galleries and maze of the underworld warrens regulated their lives. In the office of the nation's central electro plant sat a young man. He was unoccupied at the moment. He was an example of the marvelously slow process of evolution, for to all outward appearances he differed little from the twentieth century man. Keen intelligence sat on his fine-cut, kindly young face. In general build he was lighter, more refined than a man of the past. Yet even the long, delicately colored robe of mineral silk which he wore could not detract from his obvious virility and strength. His face flashed in a smile when a girl suddenly appeared in the middle of the room, materializing, so it seemed, out of nowhere. She resembled him to some extent, except that she was exquisitely feminine, dark-haired with a skin of warm ivory, while he was blonde and ruddy. Her tinkling, silvery voice was troubled as she asked, have I your leave to stay, Michel Ares? The look of adoration he gave her was answer enough. But he answered with the conventional formula, It is given. He rose to his feet, walked right through the seemingly solid vision, and made an adjustment on a bank of dials. Then he walked through the apparition again, and standing beside his chair, looked at her inquiringly. You haven't forgotten, Michel, this is the day of the referendum? Michel smiled slightly. It would be a day of confusion in Subterranea if he should forget. As chief of the Technies, he was in direct charge of the tabulating machines that would, in a few seconds after the vote, give the result in the matter of the opening of the frozen gate. But the girl's concern sobered him instantly. On the decision of the people at noon, depended the life-work of her father, Senator Maine, and it was now nine o'clock. "'I'm sure they will order the gate opened,' he said instantly. "'All the technies are agreed that your father is right, that the great cold was only another, more severe ice age, not the death of the sun. The technies—' Just as the girl had seemingly materialized, a young man now stood beside her. In appearance, he was a picture of pride, power, arrogance, and definite danger. His hawk-like, patrician features were smiling. This olive-skinned, dark young rival of Michel was Lane Mullen, son of Senator Mullen, ruthless administration leader and bitter opponent of Senator Maine's exodus faction. Lane looked at Michel insolently. Have I your leave to stay, Michel Ares? he asked. It is given, said Michel, without enthusiasm. I am not calling on you of my own will, Michel, the apparition of young Mullen said contemptuously. But Nita had the telucid turned on as I stepped into the room. It's as well for you that you're not here personally, Michel replied promptly. The last time we met, I believe I was obliged to knock you down. Lane Mullen flushed with a sidelong glance at Nita. The girl gave Michel a frightened look. Lane interpreted her concern rightly. Ordinarily, it's not safe to try anything like that with me. I could have you executed in half an hour. But I don't have to call on the state to punish you. Nita... You'll admit I'm taking no unfair advantage of him. Oh, I do, Lane, but... Lane reached out his hand to the dial, invisible to Michel, which operated the Toulousid apparatus, and immediately the apparitions vanished. Michel looked at his own Toulousid, 
its great unwinking eye sat in the wall, but he did not project his own illusory body to the girl's home. He was a techni, one of the pitifully few trained men and women who kept the intricate automatic machinery working. On them rested the immense, stupid civilization of the caverns, and there was work to do. Michel felt that on this morning of her father's greatest trial, Nita would pay scant attention to Lane. Michel was testing some of the controls when Gobit Hanlon came in. Gobit was also a techni, and Michel's special friend. Like Michel, he wore the light robe that was universal among the civilians in the equable climate of the caverns. He walked with the light, springy step that was somehow characteristic of the specialized class to which he belonged, as distinguished from the languid gait of the pampered, lazy populace. Attached to his girdle of flat chain links was a tiny computing machine about as large as the palm of a man's hand, for Gobit did most of the mathematical work. You'll want me at the tabulating section? Gobit stated inquiringly. It may be well, Michel smiled. For the first time in centuries, I believe the general public is going to vote. Flo's Entine wants to come along. Michel's smile changed to a grin. He knew the pretty, willful, little sweetheart of Gobitz. If she wanted to be at the tabulating plant, she would be there. In fact, Gobit confessed somewhat sheepishly, she's in the car. The car was waiting in the gallery. It had no visible support but hovered a few inches above the floor, above one of two parallel aluminum alloy strips that stretched like the trolley tracks of the ancients throughout all the galleries. The ancients well knew that aluminum is repelled by magnetism, but the race had lived in the caverns for centuries before evolving an alloy that possessed this repulsive power to a degree strong enough to support a considerable weight. Under Michel's guidance, the car moved forward silently, through interminable busy streets, with arched roofs, lined on either side with doors that led to homes, theaters, and food-distributing automats. Occasionally they passed public gardens, purely ornamental, in which a few specimens of vegetation were preserved. They passed multitudes of people, most of them handsome, with a pampered, hothouse prettiness but betraying the peculiar lassitude which had been sapping the energies of this once dynamic race for millennia. Yet today they showed almost eagerness. The name of Leo Main, prophet of deliverance, was on every tongue. And what was the sun like? Like the great vitalites that were prescribed by law and evaded by everyone, except possibly the technies? Those technies, they seemed to delight in work. Curious glances fell on the gliding car. Some work in connection with the referendum? What must one do to vote? Oh, the Toulousid. Arriving at Administration Circle, the car entered a vast excavation half a mile in diameter, possibly a thousand feet high at the dome. Here were the entrances to some of the principal government warrens. Here also centered the streets, like radiating spokes of a wheel on which many of the officials lived. Here the emanation bulbs, which were more frequent than in the galleries, so that the light was almost glaring. Guards of soldier police, the stolid, well-fed, specialized class produced by centuries of a static civilization, were everywhere. Not in the memory of their grandparents had they done any fighting but in their short, brightly colored tunics, flaring trousers, and little kepis, they looked very smart. Their only weapon was a small tube capable of projecting a lethal light ray. Michel led his party to the audience hall. It was only a few hundred feet in diameter. At one end was the speaker's rostrum. Senator Maine was already there. He was tall, purposeful, but withal tired and wistful-looking. His graying hair was cut at the nape of the neck, sweeping back from his swelling temples in a manner really suggestive of a mane. His large, luminous eyes lit up, 
Is it nearly time? Yes, Senator, Mitchell said. The nation will soon assemble. Have you met Senator Mullen? I have had the pleasure, Mitchell acknowledged with a polite irony, since Senator Mullen gives me practically all my orders. Mullen acknowledged the tribute with a quick smile, without rising from his chair. He, too, is different from the average subterranean in that he was forceful and aggressive, like Senator Maine. He was still youngish-looking, of powerful, blocky build. His dark hair was carefully parted in the middle and brushed down sleekly. The twentieth century had known his prototype. The successful, powerful, utterly unscrupulous politician, and in a different sphere that type of extra-governmental ruler which the ancients called gangster. It was casually discussed in Subterranea that certain of the state soldier police were responsible for the mysterious assassinations that had so conveniently removed most of the effective resistance to Mullen's progress in the Senate. The once potent body had not held a session in ten years. Didn't dare to, a cynical and indifferent public said and a strange reluctance on the part of qualified men to accept the presidential nomination had left that office unfilled for the past three years. Mullen, as party dictator, performed the duties of president provincially. Floss, mischievous as usual, rounded her great blue eyes and gazed at Mullen with an expression of rapt admiration. Oh, Senator, she thrilled, I think it's wonderful of you to give Senator Maine an opportunity to debate with you. You are so kind. Mullen failed to detect any mockery. Luckily for a floss, he looked at her with half-closed eyes. The public must be satisfied, he rumbled. Senator Maine has aroused in them great hopes. A small matter might be adjusted, but only a referendum will satisfy them in this. But, Senator, the race is going to ruin. If we could get into the sun again, wouldn't you want that? I don't believe there is a sun, Mullen replied, then, with the candor of one who is perfectly sure of himself, added, If Maine were right, I still couldn't permit the frozen gate to be opened. I can control the people for their own good here. It might not be possible outside. A deep musical note sounded. Suddenly, the myriad inhabitants of Subterranea seemed to be milling around in the room. Actually, their bodies were in their dwelling cells, but their telucid images filled the hall. By a simple adjustment of the power circuit, their images, instead of being life-size, were made only about an inch high, permitting the accommodation of the entire nation in the hall. Their millions of tiny voices mingling made a sighing sound. Maine rose and stepped forward, raising his hand. Citizens of Subterranea, he began in powerful, resonant tones, and then went on to put into his address all the fervor of a lifetime of endeavor. He told them of those times in the dim past when the human race still dwelt on the surface of the earth, of the sun that poured out inexhaustible floods of life and light, of the green things that were grown not only to look at, but for food for all living things before food was made synthetically out of mind chemicals, of the world overrun by a teeming, happy, dynamic civilization. Then something happened. The sun seemed to give less light, less heat. Perhaps we ran into a cloud of cosmic dust that intercepted the sun's rays, Perhaps the cause was to be found in some change in the sun's internal structure, but the effects could not be doubted. Ice began to come down from the poles. Ice barriers higher than the highest towers covered the world, wiping out all life but the most energetic. Our ancestors and many other advanced nations began to burrow toward the hot interior of the earth. We today have no idea of the labor that went into the digging of our underground home. We are becoming degenerate. More and more of us, even those who still use the vitalites, are becoming pale and flabby. 
there are hardly enough technies to keep the automatic machinery in order. What will happen when those technies also deteriorate and lose the will to work? For deteriorate they must, just as Senator Mullen and his still active allies will, just as I will if I live long enough. There is a great force that we never know here. It is called the cosmic ray. It never penetrates to our depth and our vitalites do not produce it. He then spoke of the proposed exodus, argued, pleaded, painted a rosy picture of the outer world, of a sun come back, a world of brightness and life. At the conclusion of his speech, a sigh arose from the assembled millions, a sigh of hope, of half-belief. Had the vote been taken then, the frozen gate would have been opened. But Senator Mullen was on the rostrum, holding up a square, well-manicured hand for attention. In his deep, rumbling bass, he tore the arguments for the exodus to shreds. With the whip of fear, he drove away hope. If our savage ancestors lived on the inhospitable outer shell of the earth, he shouted, is that a reason for our taking that retrograde step? Read your histories. What happened to our neighboring nation of Atlantica only a short 15,000 years ago? They did just as this man is urging, opened their outer gate. It promptly froze open, and liquid air, the remnant of what in primordial days was an outer atmosphere, poured down the tunnels. The whole nation died, and we saved ourselves only by blasting the connecting passages between them and us with fulminite. A wave of fear passed over the tiny massed figures. For centuries the race had been rapidly losing all initiative, except for those few leaders who threw superior stamina and religious devotion to the artificial sun rays had maintained something of their pristine energy. Now they were hysterical with fear of the unknown. Even as Michel Ares adjusted the parabolic antenna of the thought receptor vote counting machine, he knew what the verdict would be. In a moment, the vote was flashed on a screen on the ceiling, 421 in favor of the exodus, and 2,733,485 against it. There was an eerie cheer from the people, and they began to dissolve like smoke. Mullen rose, bowed politely and smilingly, and walked out to where his magnetic car awaited him. It was with a feeling of deep depression that Michel Ares went to work the next morning. His despair was shared by the technies under him with whom he talked. At the Telestereo station, he found a bitter young man broadcasting a prepared commentary on the election ordered by Senator Mullen. It was congratulatory in nature, designed to confirm popular opinion that the nation had been saved from a great catastrophe and to glorify the principles of Mullen's party. And so, once more, this great nation has demonstrated its ability to govern itself, to protect itself against dangerous and unsocial experiments. The voice of the people is the voice of God. The government claims for itself no credit for this momentous decision. Each citizen has done his share toward the continuation of our safety, our prosperity. The young man finished the document, smiled a charming smile, and turned off the switch. Then he grimaced his disgust and lapsed into a glum meditation. "'What say, Kratz?' Michel asked. "'Trouble again on the West Sector. Had trouble getting power enough. Generators ought to be overhauled.' He made a helpless gesture. "'How about conscripting a little labor?' "'Tried it this morning.' Most of the people are still in a daze from chewing too much murklite. Those that are sober are too busy preening themselves for voting on the winning side. Kratz informed Michel that Mullen had that morning given up all pretense of constitutional government, had preempted the treasury, and was consolidating his position as avowed dictator. He probably wanted to do that a long time, Michel commented. 
He didn't quite dare tell that referendum yesterday gave him the real measure of the public. Well, I've got to be going. Mitchell took one of the small mechanical service tunnels back to his office. The latest news had hardly affected him. So keen was his disappointment over the defeat of the exodus. But he wanted to be alone. He walked through vast halls full of machinery, abandoned and rusting, through dark corridors that had once roared with industrial life. What would happen when the present overloaded machinery should break down, wear out? The remnants of the great technical army could hardly serve what was left. Each passing year, these silent, useless hulks became more numerous. The specter of famine was stalking amidst the dusty pipes and empty vats of the chemical plants. The horrors of darkness lurked amid the tarnished compression spheres and the long, hooded monstrosities of the power plants, inadequately served by harassed and overworked technies. In the middle of his office, Mitchell found the Telucid counterpart of Mila, sister of Nita Main. She was younger than Nita, hardly more than sixteen. Her eyes were wide with terror as she sought Mitchell. Her cheeks were wet with tears, and her silken brown hair fell in careless disarray. Mitchell, she cried, as soon as she saw him. Lane Mullen has taken Nita. Taken her? And father is under arrest. Lane came this morning, crazy with murk-like gum. He had four or five soldiers with him. When Nita refused to see him, they broke down the door and went to a room. They dragged her out to Lane's car, and he took her to his warren near the presidential quarters. She there now? Yes, father followed Lane's car. Guards kept him out of Lane's warren, so he went to see Mullen. That devil only laughed at him, offered to call another referendum. Father had a small pocket needle ray, and... Good, he killed Mullen? No, but he managed to burn a hole through his arm. He was rushed off to one of the cells, and Mullen says he will call a referendum to decide Father's fate. It would be just like that devil's sense of humor to let the people decree their only friend's death. They'll do it, too, Mila exclaimed tragically. Oh, how I wish Mother were alive. And each one will feel deep within him that he has done a great, commendable, and original thing, Michel added with keen insight. Mila sank to the floor. Go to your room, Michel said, gently, stern. Mullen and his gang have reckoned without the technies. A woman's image appeared, stooping commiseratingly over Mila, a friend of the family. Michel ordered her to care for Mila. Then he took a deep breath. Gone was his feeling of helpless sorrow, leaving only an overwhelming, steadying, satisfying anger. He flung the Telucid switch, barked cracking orders. In half an hour, every technical man of Subterranea was in a large storeroom near Mitchell's office. They were mostly young, keen, and alert, their skins red or brown from the actinic lights, their hair showing more or less bleaching from the same cause. As Mitchell talked, they became intent. They listened with a cold, deadly silence that would perhaps have made the smug millions of subterranea quake with fear. This affront put upon the only man in the government who could speak their language, who could comprehend their ideals, the peril of the girl they all knew and loved, these things set their long-repressed resentment flaring to white heat. They were ready for desperate things. A turn of a valve and water would thunder through the maze of galleries, a mishap far, far down toward the earth's hot core, and steam would rush up. But Michel steadied them. After all, Subterranea was their country. Anarchy was far from the Techni ideals. He had a plan. Nothing is to be done until we have Senator Maine and Nita, Michel instructed them. Remember that. Do nothing until you hear from me. Each of you go to your station. Set all adjustments so that they will not need attention for some weeks, at least. Those of you who have families, tell them to be ready to move to another residence. Say nothing about any trouble, understand? There were nods of assent. You will proceed to your posts and keep busy. When I come, it will be by Telucid. I will say nothing. I will simply wave my hand. 
That means you are to take your wives, your families, your sweethearts to substation number 37X. There were audible gasps. Not 37X, exclaimed one of the older men. Why, that's 20 miles up, near the frozen gate. Yes, Mitchell smiled with tight lips. You men willing? There was an instantaneous shout of approval. Curiously enough, seizure of the gate by force had not occurred to any of these law-abiding, well-disciplined group. But Mullen's lawless seizure of the government had removed all inhibitions of that sort. Seizure of the gate would bring at one stroke the realization of the dream that the technies had tried for generations to win by political means. Surely, when the gate was open and they could see the glorious half-mythical sun for themselves, the people would consent to the exodus. For the technies, even in the bitterness of defeat, were not antisocial. They hoped and worked for the devitalized races of Subterranea, for the betterment of their condition, more than for their own. The Technies were the fittest. They had demonstrated their ability to survive unchanged under adverse condition. They would be least helped by the Exodus. Yet they had worked for it all their lives, as had their fathers before them, out of unselfish love for humanity. There have always been such men. Through the murk of history we see their lives as small, steady lights, infrequent and lonely. With the opening of the frozen gate suddenly a possibility, the technies forgot their exasperation with a stupid mob. "'The gate is guarded,' said an elderly man, dubiously. "'A small guard,' Gobit Hanlon remarked quickly, and probably dazed with murklight. "'Nothing to fear.' Stay away from the gate, Mitchell instructed. Give no cause for alarm. If an emergency arises while I'm gone, see Gobit. Don't go alone, Mitchell, Gobit begged. A few of us with ray needles can storm the detention cells. We can clean out Lane's Warren. We might, but the Senator Anita would be gone. The alarm would be given. In a few minutes there'd be a mob. The technies were already dispersing eagerly. Mitchell pressed his friend's hand, saying, I'll take my needle ray, and I know every way to get around there is. Alone, I'll attract no attention. Till later, Gobet, and he was gone. Mitchell's way was through the smaller, less frequented communication passages used principally by the technies. Occasionally, he did meet citizens, still light-headed after their election victory celebration and lost, but he paid them no heed. He came to the ventilation center of that level. For ages no air had entered Subterranea from the outside. All of the air had to be regularly reconditioned, and so was returned through a systematic network of air ducts to a vast central chemical plant. It was a latter-day cave of the winds, where the north, south, east, and west winds of that buried empire regularly returned for a brief few minutes of play amid chemical sprays, condensers, humidifiers, oxidizers, to be again dispatched to their drudgery. This hull was truly colossal, filled to the shadowy ceilings a thousand feet high with gigantic pipes, tanks, wind turbines. The technie in charge had not yet returned, but Mitchell consulted the distribution plan and soon located the duct that led to Lane Mullen's warren. In a few minutes he was running, helped along by a strong current of fresh air. The map had shown the warren to be about a mile away. For the benefit of the technies who had to work there, the duct was plainly marked, and the lighting by infrequent emanation bulbs was adequate, though dim. Mitchell had made no plans for a course of action after arriving at his destination. He felt reasonably sure that if he could get into the warren, he would have a good chance to escape with Nita. In the confusion, he could hide her nearby and perhaps affect the release of the senator also. He had no doubt about his fate if he were caught. Lane's pose of good sportsmanship having failed to impress Nita, he had adopted simple, brutal coercion. Mitchell's fate, if caught interfering, would be summary execution. Mitchell found the grating which he sought. 
it bore the key number of lane's establishment the key which would unlock it was of course in the hands of the police but the bars were badly corroded and michel managed to bend them enough to permit the passage of his body he found himself in a small chamber from which ducts led to all parts of the warren these ducts were too small to permit passage of his body however it would be necessary to come into the open a small metal door promised egress michel climbed out and faced a surprised cook in the kitchen engaged in flavoring synthetic food drinks michel said explanatorily inspection air service the cook did not know the regulations about keeping the air tunnels locked moreover he like all the other servants of the mighty worked unwillingly being conscripted he only grunted michel made a pretense of testing the air currents presently he stepped into one of the communicating corridors the warren was planned something like a house of the surface age with luxuriously furnished rooms baths dining halls and all of the appurtenances of wealth arriving at a rotunda in the center of which was a glowing fountain michel encountered a guard boldly he asked him where is molon i wish to see him the guard looked surprised about nita main sir i would hardly dare michel looked at the man sharply but there was no hint of recognition in the stupid phlegmatic face what about nita main it is about her i wish to speak there was a slight stirring of interest in the soldier's face he will be glad to see you sir if you bring news of her Eh, uh, yes. Perhaps what I have to tell him will be of no interest to him. If you can tell him where she is, he will ask no more of you. She made good her escape, then? Slow suspicion was dawning at last. For one who brings news, you ask a lot of questions, the guard remarked heavily, as his hand slipped to the needle-ray weapon at his side. Show your pass. Like a flash, Michel was upon him, his hand at the thick throat, the other grasping the wrist. Although the soldier, like the majority of the populace, lacked the intense vitality of the technies, he had stubborn strength, and he fought effectively in the drilled, automatic way of his kind. Michel was further handicapped by the necessity of maintaining silence. One shout and a dozen needle rays would no doubt perforate his body with holes and slash his flesh with smoldering cuts. Grunting and sweating, they fought all around the rose-colored curb of the fountain. At last Michel succeeded in forcing his adversary over the low stone, and they went over together with a resounding splash. The straining body of the guard suddenly relaxed, and a spreading red cloud in the water disclosed that he had struck his head against the first of the terraces that rose in the fountain's mist-shrouded center. Up one of the corridors a door opened, and an angry voice shouted, Gurkha, Gurkha, I'll have you in bracelets. Captain of the guard, sir. From another of the corridors came a sound of running feet. A command rang out. On the double. An officer, followed by four soldiers, dashed around the corner and flashed by the fountain. Peering over the curb, Michel saw them, some hundred yards away, come to a halt before an open door. With a thrill of exultation, Michel recognized the tall figure of Lane Mullen, looking like a slightly damaged satyr of the better class, for his head was bandaged, and he was in bad humor. Captain, he stormed, I want you to put that damned louse in solitary confinement for a year, here? Yes, sir, like a megaphone, the long corridor carried the low, respectful words to Michel's ears. Lane continued to storm. And if you put another damned murk-like crazy blunker on guard in this place, I'll have your commission, here? Yes, sir. A quick decision was necessary, and Michel acted without hesitation. The guard had rolled over on his back so that his face was out of the water, and he was breathing with quick, painful gasps. Michel dragged him up under the concealing shelter of the fountain spray, and there changed clothes with him. In the meantime, the flowing water washed away the red stain of blood. When the captain returned with his guard, Michel was lying realistically in the pool, apparently deep in a drugged sleep. The little kepi tilted rakishly over his face.
he was roughly seized and dragged out of the water to the accompaniment of much cursing a fist crashed into his face suddenly the soldiers felt the supine figure under their hands explode into energy elbows and fists seemed to fly from all directions at once a needle ray appeared and before they could draw their own weapons they were howling with pain as searing welts drew over their bodies with one accord they plunged into the pool only the officer remained and he fell to the mosaic floor his weapon half raised the small black hole in his chest giving off a burnt odor Michel appropriated the officer's brassard of rank and, menacing the cowed guards, forced them to herd into a nearby room, carrying the body of the officer with them. Michel locked the door and looked around. He saw no one observing him and could count on carrying a pretty good bluff in his uniform, which was rapidly shedding its water. With a firm step, Michel walked to Lane Mullen's door, threw it open, and entered. Lane sat up on his couch, his feet striking the floor with an angry thump. But when he recognized Michel, he paled slightly. "'Where is she?' Michel demanded roughly. "'Before I burn you down.' "'You said once,' Lane began sneeringly, "'that you wanted to fight me. "'Now, if you'll just put down that—' "'Not now,' Michel dissented with deadly coldness. "'Where is Nita? Speak fast.' Lane did so. "'She isn't here.' The little short crowned me with a chair and slipped out. How did I... When? Hurry up. Hardly an hour ago. She walked down the corridor, showed a thick-witted guard my own executive pass, and got away. But I got that guard. Never mind what you did to the guard. Suddenly, the image of an officer, strange to Michel, stood in the room and saluted smartly. Has Captain Egan, Mr. Lane, Mullins leave to stay? He asked. Mullen started forward, but before he could disclose his predicament, Michel had sided over to him and thrown one arm affectionately over his shoulder. In his hand, concealed by the rich folds of Lane's robe, Michel held his needle ray, and it was pressed firmly against Lane's ribs. "'Mr. Mullen will be glad to hear you,' Michel said smoothly. He fancied that the eyes of the officer's image dilated slightly but it lost none of its military rigor. But some explanation of his presence there in his still damp uniform must be given, Egan, so he growled in a voice that he tried to make a bit thick, as if he had chewed too much murklight. At ease, Captain, at ease. Damn it, man, you don't have to be so damned military. You're among friends. And he tousled Lane's dark hair affectionately. Captain Egan looked his disgust. Sir, he said to Lane, we captured Nita Main as she tried to board a public car near the executive mansion. The black lens at the end of Michel's needle ray pressed hard, and Lane said naturally, You have her in custody? Sir, we have. And to Michel's dismay, Nita, defiant, her lovely form half revealed by rents in her garments, seemed to materialize beside the officer. Her wrathful eyes were fixed on Lane, and then she saw Michel. The technie put all his will into the pleading stare which he returned, and she understood. She gave no sign of recognition, but favored both Lane and Michel equally with the chill of her disdain. Sir, what are your orders? Lane glanced aside at Michel, acutely conscious of the lethal pressure in his ribs. It's all right with me, old fellow. Michel squawked good-humoredly. This is your girl that got away from you? Let's both go over and bring her back. Lane nodded assent. The soldier saluted, and his vision and that of the girl disappeared. And we're going to do just that, Michel added, in an entirely changed voice. Get up, you. Act right. Speak right. Do right, and you may live to see another day. So the two left the warren in apparent amity, and walked the beautiful street with its richly formed, brightly colored arches, its seemingly illimitable vistas, its luxuriant, pampered decorative vegetation, its blazing lights, until at last they came to administration circle and entered the ponderous gates behind which lay the very heart of the government. They were challenged at once, although the officer of the guard knew Lane, 
usage required the showing of the daily pass many high officers of the government had in years past fallen from grace overnight this formality complied with lane and mitchell the latter with his ray needle ever ready sat down to wait in the guardroom and lane under mitchell's quiet prompting ordered that nita and her father be brought to him we shall bring the girl yes the astonished officer protested but not senator maine he is a prisoner of state perhaps you don't know captain mitchell suggested smoothly that it is not wise to disregard the orders of the provincial president's son it would cost me my commission perhaps my life the officer said neither would be worth much if you disobey mitchell countered a wire edge creeping into his voice the officer looked into lane's stormy face then with great reluctance retreated to carry out the order in about ten minutes he was back with four guards and his prisoners he explained that captain egan was detained on official duty you may go said lane prompted by a jab in the ribs a written receipt please sir for the senator glowering lane wrote out the desired document at last they were alone our program mitchell announced briskly is simple you will conduct us to one of the government cars and will ride with us to such places as we may direct and i shall release you when it pleases me if you then want to fight I will accommodate you. I would be willing to fight you as head of the technies, Lane countered sullenly, but I wouldn't be bothered with a rebel and a traitor. You've overstepped yourself this time, my fine bolthead, and all I ask is a front seat at your execution. They stepped into the brightly lighted hall, and in that instant Mitchell felt a searing heat on his shoulder. Without a moment's pause, he hurled Senator Maine and the girl back into the room, at the same moment he flung an arm around lane's neck and pulled him back into the doorway where he could use him as a shield while he cautiously peered out into the corridor his shoulder throbbed painfully but his movement had prevented the needle ray from penetrating deeply in any one place a short distance up the corridor was a wider space in the center of which stood a large bronze urn filled with exotic plants behind this urn were several soldiers and mitchell recognized the sharp-eyed captain egan so that officer had recognized the true state of affairs or had strong suspicions but in his haste and eagerness he had overlooked one important fact in the guardroom were riot rays heavy replicas of the ordinary hand weapons they had not been needed for many years but the technies had always kept them fully charged and in order nita mitchell called not removing his eye from the doorway. Yes, she was standing beside him, and Mitchell thrilled to the admiration and positive affection in her intonation. Notice those short tubes mounted on light wheels over against the walls? Those are riot ray projectors. Wheel me over a couple. Nita did as directed. Mitchell stuck the stubby muzzle of one of the nearest weapons into the corridor, pulled the lever, and swung the ray in an arc toward the ambushed soldiers. There was a sharp crackling noise, and the heat chipped myriads of flakes off the stone walls, leaving a gray path across the rich murals, and the air was filled with flying particles. The heat was terrific. It beat back into the doorway. Captain Egan gave a short, sharp order, and he and his men retreated before the bronze urn began to wilt and drip melted metal. He could not be accused of cowardice, for his hand weapons were puny compared to the riot rays. Quick! Before he gets in touch with the outer guard, Mitchell urged his prisoner forward, Senator Maine following. The grave patriarch of rhetoric made a striking picture as he dragged the second riot ray along. The other one was abandoned, locked with full power on. It was converting that corridor into an inferno, and there would be no pursuit through that avenue. Mitchell pulled open the metal door suddenly. The two guards on duty were just coming in, their hand weapons ready they never knew what struck them for there was no time for compunction but even as their bodies sank to the paving there was the harsh clangor of alarm bells soldiers dashed from everywhere and came running their needle rays menacing in there mitchell shouted he pointed to the doors at the dead guards as they hesitated he added revolution they're storming the president's office hear the rays through the doors came a faint humming 
an acrid smell of heat, of stone, and metal fumes. A corporal saluted Mitchell, recognized Lane's haggard features, and Lane again felt that cogent persuader in his ribs. "'That's right, corporal,' he said bitterly. "'Is the guard room occupied, sir?' "'Not now, you fool,' Mitchell snapped at him. This resolved the last of the corporal's misgivings. Giving an order, he led his men in, gasping. "'Now we'll run,' Mitchell ordered, giving Lane a shove. "'Coming, Nita?' She was dragging her father along joyously. They crossed the broad pedestrian walk, and in the street found an official car nestling on one of the tracks. "'Even the riot ray, will you, old fellow?' Mitchell requested jovially, and Lane did. Then the listless chauffeur turned a controller, and the big car rose a few inches, lightly as a feather, and sped away swiftly through the maze of traffic. Some time later they were in a service lift, not one of the great public lifts that carry their hundreds at a trip, but one of the small lifts used mostly by the technies and known to few outside their ranks. Mitchell, standing blissfully close to Nita and her father, enjoyed his moment of relaxation. Many things had been attended to. Lane had been released at last in one of the catacomb cemeteries, it would take him at least two hours to find his way out. They were discussing the riot ray which they had with them. "'I hope we won't have to exhaust it in a fight before we get out,' Senator Maine said anxiously. "'It would be a splendid weapon if we encounter a hostile environment outside.' "'The gate is guarded,' Mitchell said practically, "'but we expect to surprise them. No use worrying.' The lift came to a stop at an airlock. The great elevator shafts were closed by airlocks every 2,000 feet. The reason is obvious. If the air of the great spheroid subterranean nation were allowed to freely obey the laws of gravity, it would be oppressively dense in the lower levels and excessively rarefied in the upper ones. While the airlocks were operating, Mitchell stepped to a telucid and gave the agreed-on signal. In another half hour they were at 37X, the great, dusty, and little-used storeroom was only poorly lighted. It was dank and had an uncomfortable chill. Technies and their families were coming in from all sides, and it was not long before some five hundred persons, men, women, and children, were assembled. Many of them were pale and frightened-looking, for they were staking everything on an ideal, a theory. There would be no coming back. The statute books of Subterranea decreed only one penalty, death for even the merest tampering with the frozen gate. It was not like this that they had visioned the opening of the gate. Under properly controlled conditions, it would have been possible to open the gate for preliminary explorations. But not now. They were outside the law. Nita, standing beside Michelle, shivered and pulled her overrobe closer around her. There was sadness in her voice as she said, These children, they remind me of the thousands of children we must abandon with our people. If I could, I'd steal a few to take with us. Michelle grinned without mirth. And be damned as a kidnapper of a particularly horrible sort as long as Subterranea lasts? I know, I know, but what will happen to them all when the automatic machinery fails? They may learn to run it, if they have to. Or if we succeeded in establishing ourselves in the outer world, we can tunnel back to them around the gate in a year or so. Don't worry about them too much. We're taking the big risk, not they. Gobit Hanlon, accompanied by Flaw Sentine and Mila Main, approached. He was loaded down with a huge case of concentrated food. I have given orders to bring with us all the cold-resisting fabrics we could carry. Got them loaded down, eh? All here. Every last one. Let's go, then. Mitchell stepped to a small door that led into the main corridor close to the gate. This door had not been used by the technies when assembling. Through a tiny hole, the guard, four soldiers, could be seen about a blanket, tossing sixteen-sided dice. Mitchell opened the door, his needle ray pointed. Don't move or you burn, he commanded harshly. The guards, taken completely by surprise, did not move. 
In a few moments, they were bound, gagged, and dumped into a corner of 37X. Eager technies were swarming over the complicated mechanism that they had dared to touch before, only for inspection and maintenance. The frozen gate was like a huge stopper in a bottle, made of chromium steel. It was 30 feet in diameter and 30 feet thick from its well-insulated inside face to that enigmatical outside that had been a grisly mystery to the race for some five hundred centuries. There was a flash of sparks and the quiet hum of motors. With a shuddering groan, the great plug freed itself from the grip of millennia, turned a few inches in its hole. The supporting gimbals took the load now, and slowly the great mass moved inward, carried by an overhead traveling crane whose track was bolted to the rock roof. The rate of movement was slow, not much over three or four inches a minute. An excited murmur filled the cavern, almost hysterical joy. But Michel, watching that widening margin for the dreaded gush of liquid air, only trembled with relief. At least the calamity that had visited rash Atlantica would not be repeated here. A young techni, one of the heat distributors, climbed up the heavy bosses on the gateway's face. I'm going to be the first to see the sun, he shouted joyously. His challenging gaze roved over the waiting crowd, and suddenly his face turned ashen. For at the turn of the corridor, some hundred yards away, he had seen men. No mistaking those uniforms, they were soldiers, and Michel, following his gaze, saw a riot ray being wheeled into place. His own riot ray already commanded the corridor, but he dared not use it. The soldiers, under the partial protection of the turn, could incinerate the helpless technies with little danger to themselves. Wait, Michel shouted, running into the open. An officer came to meet him. He then recognized Captain Egan, whose exceptional shrewdness had almost undone him before. Egan could not see the slow movement of the gate, and Michel himself, weaponless, counted only on parlaying for time. They met midway between the two forces, and the small black lens of the captain's weapon pointed steadily at Michel's chest. Michel Ares, I arrest you. It seemed that the captain's fine gray eyes looked out of the lean face with real sympathy. It may be there will be executive clemency for these people of yours, but for you? Michel, tense and deadly, saw the captain's vigilant attention leave his face for a second, saw his eyes widen in consternation. He could not know that Egan had seen a slender crescent of green light appear in the frozen gate, but he did not lose the opportunity. His fist crashed on the captain's jaw so that the soldierly figure reeled and the needle ray fell to the ground. Michel leapt after him, picked him up, held him. The riot ray was turned full on him, and a soldier's hand trembled on the lever, but it did not pull. "'You'll kill him!' Michel shouted." and then he ventured to turn his head to look at the gate. He saw the first of the fugitives struggle into the narrow crack. The gate seemed to have stuck, and there was barely room to pass. Egan, half-conscious, was trying to rain blows on Michel's back, compelling him to stop and pass the officer's hand through the belt of his tunic and to manacle him with a pair of bracelets which he found in his pocket. As he staggered toward the gate with his burden, he saw Gobit beside him, the stolen riot ray menacing the soldiers who would otherwise have rushed in. Suddenly, Egan struggled upright. Fire, he commanded, in stentorian tones. They'll kill you too, you fool, Michel exclaimed angrily. I'm a soldier, Egan answered with contempt. His legs barely supported his weight, and he was struggling to free his manacled hands. He threw himself into the narrow crevice of the gate to obstruct the stream of fugitives. He started to shout again, Fi Crack! Again, Michel's fist caught him. He hooked the officer's elbow over two of the bosses so that he was supported in plain sight of his men and turned to urge haste. The last two stragglers were hurrying through, and with relief, Michel turned to follow but he set the closing mechanism in motion before he leaped for the narrow opening that was becoming still narrower. 
though very slowly. Now for that green crescent of light and hope. He felt a wave of heat. Glancing back, he saw the irresolute guards scattered by the enraged charge of a square, blocky man in civilian robe. The usually smiling provincial president, Senator Molon, Molon himself was fumbling with the lever of the riot ray. Egan had evidently reported where he was going before starting in pursuit of the technies. Again that withering flash of heat, and Mitchell saw Captain Egan, still semi-conscious, suddenly turn red-faced. Molin would burn him up without compunction, in the hope of catching one of the fugitive technies. And now a figure in uniform leaped forward at Molin's angry gesture and bent purposefully to the sighting tube. The crescent was now so slender that Michel had to turn sideways to squeeze back into the corridor, and slowly, inexorably, it was growing smaller still. With desperate haste, the practiced uniformed man was adjusting his range. Captain Egan struggled when Michel seized him. I arrest! Michel thought for a sickening moment that he was caught in the closing gate. Then he was free in the cylindrical tunnel into which the plug was creeping. Luckily, Egan was slight. His body squeezed through with little more difficulty than Michel's own. Now the opening was too small for any man's body. A red glow illuminated that narrowing slit. An acrid wave of heat and the smell of burnt metal came with the strong current of air that blew out of subterranea. Michel dragged his captive down the rocky tunnel the floor of which dipped gently away from the gate, for drainage, no doubt. Around a bend, the source of the greenish light was apparent. The fugitives were in an ice cavern. The light seemed to emanate from roof and walls. The air was uncompromisingly chill, for the blast of warm air from subterranea had stopped. But the cold of the air was nothing to the icy chill that settled on the heart of Michel Ares and the hearts of Senator Maine and the other leaders of this desperate enterprise. So this, this was the outside, a cavern of ice, small, hemmed in, those ancient folk legends of a son. I arrest you, Michel Ares. Michel laughed shortly. What a single-minded fellow this Captain Egan was still groggy, of course, didn't know where they were. He left the soldier with a red, blistered face. Michel, Michel, a voice echoed shrilly from the ice walls. It was a high-pitched voice, and an excited one. A boy came flying out of a narrow crevice, his short robe flying, his cloth-wrapped legs twinkling. Michel, he shouted, I saw it. I saw the sun, the beautiful sun. Lucky it was that in the rush no one was hurt. The small cleft opened into a wide tunnel, a low-roofed cave through which milky-white water flowed. The cave opened upon a vista of blue sky in towering mountains whose tops were burdened with snow, and upon whose side glaciers slid down and melted, and the milky-white stream brawled down into a green valley far, far below. On a mountain meadow, not far from the glacier that still buried the frozen gate, they rested. And so came a new strain of humanity upon the surface of the earth, a strain tempered and refined by the inexorable process of evolution and environment. Already animal life had reappeared, drastically changed and ruthlessly weeded out by the most severe ice age the world had ever known. And now, man stood once more on a new threshold of time. Something of this may have passed through the minds of the refugees, luxuriating in the strong sunlight of this mountain meadow, and in active and alert brains the foundations of a new civilization were already being built. They were preparing to go into the valley below when there was a dull concussion. The glacier over the frozen gate rose slightly, then disappeared completely out of sight, leaving a yawning hole in the mountainside. Ice and rocks slid down, filling the hole. The refugees gazed at the scene in fear and wonder. They have blown up the gate, and the chambers leading to it. Senator Maine, now only Leo Maine, 
said slowly, There goes our last chance to save them. His tones were deeply sad. He could not look upon those people as an experiment that nature had abandoned, although he knew that history is thronged with the shadows of vanished races culled by the process of natural selection. But youth looks only ahead. The majority of the rescued technies were young, and with eagerness and anticipation they followed Michel and Nita Ares down into the valley to build their first homes. End section 5